So now we come to Anthony Giddens, writer of one of the most famous sociology textbooks. His idea was basically to combine both structure and action as a basic unit of sociological analysis. So for Giddens, we should bridge the gap between structure and action. Rather than looking solely at social structure as a basic unit of analysis or focusing only on the meanings behind social action, Giddens believed in seeking a way out of this dialectical dualism, which is to create polar and opposites. So he came up with this term called structuration, which refers to the process in which people make and remake social structure. That is to say, we are all part of the social structure because we are influenced by it, but we too can influence it in return. And we do this over the course of, of our daily lives. This is because society only has structure if people behave in regular ways. As you could probably recall, when we talk about social institutions, they are really sets of established practices that we need to continually perform in order to keep them alive. So, in conclusion, what all these theories have in common that we've seen so far is that they have all been inspired by the Enlightenment one way or another. For example, all these theories assume that there is an order to life and social change, and that this order can be shown by rational understanding, which is even more superior to just having common sense. And this knowledge can lead to improvements in society. So it would appear that sociology seems to have succeeded the Enlightenment project, being able to be a vessel for the Enlightenment to achieve its objectives. It is basically supposed to be the era after modernity, which we call post-modernity. And we'll see a lot of these terms that sound and look almost the same, but they're really quite different, although related. So postmodern theory differs from the other theories in that it rejects the Enlightenment ideals. In fact, it challenges sociological theory in the following ways. It challenges the ontology of the nature of contemporary societies, the status of sociological knowledge, and the purpose of sociological research. So let's go through some of the terms connected with this phenomenon. Apart from being spelled slightly differently, they also represent different things. First of all, we have the era called post-modernity, which of course, post implies after, so it's a social formation arising after the period of modernity. And then we also have post-modernism. As we can see, anything that has an ism after it usually is a school of thought. So it's a cultural and social belief or beliefs that result from living in post-modernity. And then we have post-modern theory, where it is a new branch of theory that corresponds directly to understand and to explain post-modernity. Now, so what exactly is the postmodern world? So of course, postmodernists aren't the only ones who realize that a major social change took place in the late 20th century. For sociologists, they also describe this entire social change as globalization. The problem is that they are all using different words and everyone says their term is the best. Not to mention, they are also all using different definitions. While postmodernists say that the most developed societies have become postmodern, that is after modernity, Giddens says we are still in late modernity. So Giddens, the theorist of structuration, argues that we are essentially still in the same stage, which is modernity, that is to say, it is a break away from traditional values into embracing scientific values with the goal of industrialization, but we are still on the same stage and we haven't come to an after stage. For Harvey, a postmodern theorist, he describes a new phenomenon called space-time compression. He says that the information explosion that has occurred recently has not increased conformity of mainstream values, but has instead resulted in more fragmented perspectives. Because society has become characterized by meaningless objects, such as endless shopping malls, where people shop not only for consumer goods, but for new lifestyles, beliefs, images, and identities. Hence, identity becomes more fragile. 
social facts or social constructs like gender, education, class, ethnicity, all don't really serve as boundaries anymore because they believe that all these things have become fluid. And what sociologists term social structures now has become diluted. And basically, it's like no one cares about them. And this could result in anomie. Hall, another postmodernist, calls it the decentering of the subject. So in other words, it's like everything is relative and everything goes. It's like there's no rules anymore. So in postmodern social theory, the concept is that identity becomes a movable feast, formed and transformed continuously in relation to the ways in which we are represented and or addressed in the cultural systems which surround us. We are confronted by a bewildering, fleeting multiplicity of possible identities, any one of which we could identify with, at least temporarily. Hall, 1992. So all those generalizations sociologists used to make about the relationship between social institutions and individual behavior have become increasingly threatened as a concept. It's like, can we still take that for granted anymore? If you look at examples in society at large today around the world, you'll see that things like social class, um, ethnicity, even gender can seemingly be overcome, sometimes by the use of medical techniques that involve surgery. So in other words, everything can now be deconstructed. As we recall, Derrida talked about deconstruction, where you can tear down a structure and rebuild it. Even things like gender, social class, family, etc. Which brings us to the definition of deconstruction. So let's go in more detail to what Derrida said about deconstruction. Largely, deconstruction means to carefully analyze and break down something into smaller building blocks. For example, one might take an entire Lego structure and then reduce it to its individual Lego pieces. So there are two components to deconstruction, philosophical and literary. And the aim of deconstruction is to expose the binary or dialectic or dualist modes of thinking that exist in any given text. 